What's up, everybody? My name is Patrick Jones, and on this week's episode, we have Jacob Nix. Jacob is currently a pitcher in the San Diego Padres organization. He's had a, a unique journey as a professional baseball pitcher and really opens up in this episode on, on what he's been through from an injury standpoint. Um, he even opens up about having the yips several times and being able to, to conquer and beat the yips. And he has some, some great tips for people who are struggling with that um, right now. So awesome stuff. Appreciate him coming on the show. Make sure to subscribe and hope you enjoy this one. All right, we now welcome on Jacob Nix to the show. Jacob, appreciate you coming on the show today, man. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So, you know, I was doing some research before we started, uh, before this podcast, and man, you've had a, a ton of injuries. I was reading that even back when I believe you were 11 years old, you were involved in a like a serious collision. I mean, take me through your your story. I'm I'm very, very curious. So, like you said, when I was 11... I gotten like I was a catcher and I got in a really bad like a uh, you know a head on collision at the plate and shortly thereafter I my back was like really messed up and you know I couldn't my you know at the time everyone's like oh you're fine you're fine like you know just just play through it and sure enough I you know I couldn't so we ended up going to the doctor yada yada getting the MR or I think we got a X rays. Actually, I think I was in there for, I think I broke my wrist. This was in like, I think I was in sixth grade and I like broke my wrist or something. And they were like, you know, my back, you know, I think we mentioned like, you know, my back's been hurting. Can we like get an x-ray on it? And they got an x-ray and they're like, oh, something's going on in there. So then they sent me on to a specialist and uh, got a CT scan. Sure enough, I had what's called as a... Uh, pars defect or spondylolisthesis it's a big long word um basically my l5 vertebrae was never fused correctly from birth it was a congenital defect and so you know in order to determine whether it was an acute injury or a, something i was born with you know the first thing they told me was this is in sixth grade they told me no physical activity for the next eight months Cause they wanted me, they wanted to see if that bone would start to fuse together. Like, you know, if you break your arm, it'll fix itself. It just takes time. So basically they like immobilized me for eight months. You know, I, at that point I came back, I was like, Hey, you know, it's not bugging me. I played in, in uh, I think that was the Cooperstown tournament. No, that was whatever. I played in some tournament. I played in like a couple of tournaments and then sure enough back started hurting again. And it was like, you know, what do we do? Like, we can't, you know, we can't have surgery at 11 or 12 years old. <laughs> and they they said, like, that's what they recommended. And we were like, no, like, that's crazy. So I actually played, it was probably from 12 to 14. I didn't play baseball. I played water polo. Wow. So Yeah, I played water polo. And then... I actually got a really bad staph infection on my leg and like had to have it cut open and like, it was like nasty. And uh, so that kept me out of the pool for like two months. And at that point it was like going into freshman year that like high school feeder team. And I was like, you know, all right, I'll, you know, I'll, my back feels pretty good. We'll see. Like I'll go play baseball. And like I said, I was a catcher. And then like my first game back, I think I hit one over the left field fence. And then I hit one like off of the center field fence. Cause I could hit back in the day. Not, not anymore. But um, a few games later, like our coach asked if, you know, they were like, you know, who, who can pitch? Like everyone's arms were banged up. I was like, eh, I've pitched before. And I ended up throwing a no hitter and they were like, yeah, you can throw your gear away. <laughs> like you're not catching another game i was like uh okay so that was the last game i ever caught and you know the rest is kind of history um i played my freshman year this was back before anybody knew anything about pitch counts you know i had one week i threw 19 innings one week two, one week i threw two complete games seven innings and i threw five innings of, of relief in another game in a tournament was it a tournament high school high school week oh wow yeah, nineteen innings. And yeah, that that would have gone viral. Back. You would have got you would have gone viral on social media if you'd done that. Today. Oh yeah, 
it's funny because like looking obviously hindsight now i'm like dude what the hell you know <laughs> but like in what was that like 2010 2011 nobody knew yeah nobody knew about any of that nobody talked about it there wasn't social media like there is now you know and so it's totally different the game's changed so much in the last few years and so whatever after my freshman year we kind of realized like you know I, you know i guess i'm pretty good at this baseball thing still and you know if we're going to use it to kind of you know pay our goal my and my family's goal is always use it to pay for college i never knew anything about pro ball it was always like use this to play you know to get yourself into college that my family couldn't afford to to pay for so you know we were like after the freshman year we were like this is probably the time to take care of this back surgery you know i'd grown i was like six three as a freshman i was a big kid so the doctors were like, you know what, you know, you probably won't have to have this done again. So because I'm close to fully grown. So I had that back surgery. It was great. No issues. I didn't have any issues until 2015 when I signed with San Diego. Well, somewhere in between the 2014 draft, my physical with Houston and my 2015 physical with San Diego, I broke that. I broke my fusion again. My L. So I had my L five S one fuse, four screws, bone graft. Somewhere in that one year, I broke it again. Don't know how. You know, there was not like a single instance that I felt anything. I just know I broke it because the CT scans show that it's broken now. And. But I was like asymptomatic, so we never did anything. The team kind of didn't do anything. But what that led to was so much instability in my pelvis and in my lower back. I developed really bad compensating patterns that never got addressed for like four years. Mm. Because I, you know, I I trusted, I trusted the... I'm not not to bad mouth it, but I, tr I trusted, you know, that I was being led in the right direction with it and nobody was really doing anything. And I just kind of trusted like, yeah, I guess I don't need to do anything. And so it was lit and I, so I ended up having, I had two and a half years of dealing with groin, right groin problems. 2016 at the, I, I pitched the year in 2016 but I had like just chronic right groin tightness. Hmm. And then 2017, 2018, I had literally a chronic groin strain for two years. I think I got four or five cortisone shots in those two years. Like it just, it, it wouldn't go away. So after I got called up in 2018, I had surgery on my groin. I don't hear that very often. Surgery yeah, on so groin. I, well, they said they said it was a sports hernia. I don't think it was actually a sports hernia. So, and then they they went into my right adductor and they did like a fasciotomy, just to clear out a bunch of scar tissue. But in that, after that surgery, our team docs cut my stitches out too early of my, the one on my adductor. And so it left me with this big, nasty, you know, open wound on my leg. So they told me, don't sweat, don't work out, don't do anything until that's closed. So I pretty much sat on my ass all off season until, because I was medically not, you know, if that gets infected, that could be really bad. Right. So and this was, what was this, 2018 going into 19. Um, I got cleared January 10th because it was the day after my birthday. And I was told I would be slow played in spring training, you know, and obviously I was horribly out of shape. I'd been sitting on my butt for the last three months. Um, and I was told, you know, we're going to slow play you, you know, you'll probably be one of the last guys leaving camp, you know, if not, if you don't stay back a little bit, well, I had like, I think I had the most or the second most innings pitched in our camp when I started a game against the Mariners. We had an 11, an 11 batter, uh, bottom half. And then we had a 30 minute rain delay game gets canceled. So I've been cold for 
you know, almost an hour. I'm in the locker room. I'm in the shower. I'm literally, I don't, I'm naked. I'm in the shower and they come and get me out of the shower and they say, Hey, put your, put your back on. We're going to the, we're going to the cages. You're going to finish. And I'm like, dude, what? Like, so I had to go throw four simulated innings in the cage. And I woke up that next day and I was like, yeah, I, you know, I, I can't move like my arms, not right. Whoa. So I was severely undertrained and out of shape. You know, I, I couldn't start throwing until January and this was like middle of March. So I'd only had six weeks of playing catch to be at that point. And so of course my elbow blew out, not to mention my hip problems, everything. And so, uh, so just to, just to take a step back, you, you threw in a, in a game, like in a, on a mound. Yeah. And after it was, after you got done throwing, you hit the showers because the game got cold or whatever. And then they went and got you in the shower and you had to go back out, change again. My, to my finish. dirty clothes on. Yeah. That's insane. My wet, my wet, dirty clothes. And so, yeah, whatever. That was the first time. And then, you know, everyone recommended, you know, let's, let's try to avoid surgery. I did PRP. It it just everyone that gets it, it lasts about 18 months, mm. you know. So it was a band-aid, and I came back that year not myself. I was like 89, 92, and everything hurt. Just it was just a combination of so many compensating patterns building up over years that you know, well, and in that in that time between like when I got hurt and when I pitched in another game, I lost 45 pounds. Whoa. I was like, I need to put everything I have into this rehab. If I mean, I, like I said, I was overweight. I went from 22% body fat to 8% in like four months. Like I, I mean, I, I went all in to my diet and how I was training and stuff. So I was like, you know what? I was feeling good physically. I felt good. I felt confident. And I think I posted like a, you know, I think I had like seven starts maybe in that rehab stint. And I posted a sub two between what all the levels over a punch out an inning. So my numbers were good, but my, my stuff was terrible. And that's this was how in my, 2000, this was in 2019. Yeah. 2019. Okay. And, uh, so I was on the roster at that point, And when my rehab was done, they were like, yeah, we're not going to call you back up. And I was like, what like what more do you guys want to see like the numbers are there i'm like the you know the velocity may not be great but the numbers are there you guys have always been telling me you need to see more punch outs you need to see this and i'm like that's all there i don't walk anymore i'm i'm like i'm i'm not wasting pitches i'm going five five innings every time hit my pitch limit pretty efficiently and so like i said i put a lot into that year and you know, they were like, you know, how do you feel about the Arizona Fall League? And I was like, uh, I just said mentally, like, I need a break. I was like, if if I'm not going to be pitching up here in the in the big leagues, like, I, you know, I need a break. I'm like, I mentally I'm exhausted. Like, this is a very frustrating year. Um, and, you know, I want to go home. So they said, okay, great. You're going to pitch in the Fall League. <laughs> And, uh, that's, you know, two, two weekends later is when, uh, when I got arrested. So, you know, it was obviously looking back, like, yeah, I was, I, I didn't drink, I didn't drink like casually around the house ever, but it was like, yeah, when you're going out, like, you know, we're going to blow it out. And so obviously drinking to excess. And, uh, so yeah, that's when that whole incident happened. Um, and got DFA'd and then like I said finally got healthy in 2020 I was feeling really good really confident and then 2021 blew out and then just kind of been chasing it man so, so you have you've had two Tommy John surgeries the first time I just did PRP so I didn't get cut. okay yeah. okay and then you but said I, this past year you had some shoulder shoulder issues too yeah, labrum, my, you know, this, we all have slap tears. Mine just got a little bit bigger from my previous MRI in 2019. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, Jacob, I want to I want to hear about you have an interesting draft uh story, I would say. And it was a interesting time. There was 
can you take me through your your experience getting drafted? Because it was it's it's a wild wild experience from what I hear. Um, all right, I guess we'll start with the 2014 draft. We'll just we'll just run it through. Um, so 2014, you know, I was I kind of I kind of sh- bed my senior year. Like I I was not nearly what I was supposed to be and what I had kind of envisioned myself being. So I fell down to the fifth round after the, after the first day happened. Um, you know, I, I think, I, I think we turned down the diamondbacks in the second round or something because, you know, I had my number and this is my number. And why, why, why do you think you didn't do as well as you thought you should have done? Um, uh, it's a lot of things. Uh, the only reason I ask is you know, there's a lot, there's going to be kids listening to this and, and I just think if there's if there's something that you feel like will be beneficial for them to hear and not make the same mistake of putting pressure on yourself or whatever it is, I have no idea. But I would just be curious as to, you know, why you had these expectations, but you didn't meet them. Um, I mean, obviously, it's it's on nobody but myself. But, you know, I'll sit there and I'll in high school, we weren't allowed to shake off pitches called. I had one game where I was called 48 breaking balls and I was 95 plus in high school. So there's a little bit, and we were not allowed to shake off. And there were a few times in in the 10 innings. I remember this because we would, we talked about it in the 10 innings that I got to call my own game. I had 17 punch outs. Wow. Other like 40 or whatever. It was like, you know, less than a, less than one an inning because it was the, the, and like I said, there wasn't the information out there then as there is now where you can actually like teach younger players how to like think about calling their own game and stuff. So I didn't have a clue what I was doing, but I just overpowered guys when I, when I did, you know, what I was confident in when you go out there and you throw your best pitch with, con- you can go out there, sorry, you can go out there and throw your worst pitch with conviction and it's going to be better than your best pitch if you're se- if you're second guessing it mm. every time. So that's I like that. That was a big portion of it. Obviously, you know, it was up to me to go out there and throw it. And there was just times that I wasn't confident out there. And like mechanically, like I was kind of all over the place. I kind of started throwing a curveball and a slider, and like they kind of morphed into one pitch. And so like it, and after high school, so I guess we'll go into the draft, like whatever. I, t- I think I turned down the diamondbacks in the second round or something, because like I said, my number was my number and didn't get picked on that first day. So I went to bed thinking, you know, I was signed with UCLA. I went to bed that night, you know, talked to the family and everything. And we were like, you know, what? this is what we're going to do. This is, you know, a good thing, whatever. And uh, my agent called me the next morning and was like, you know, cause the second day of the draft starts pretty early. And he's like, Hey, get up. We might have something. And I was like, okay. And sure enough, Houston takes me in the, in the fifth round for, you know, one five. And that was like 1.2 over slot. And so um, I was going to be an Astro. Sick. A few weeks later, flew out to Houston to do my physical, yada, yada. My whole family was there. Um, took my physical, you know, it was a, I think I spent five hours in an MRI machine that day. <laughs> like back, hip, shoulder, elbow, like we hit everything. And uh, passed you know, green light, good to go. So we go back to the hotel. I think I took a nap and we're supposed to be doing like a press conference later. And the scouting director at the time, like called me into uh, me and my mom. And I think I forget who else, but into a conference room. And I was like, Hey, we're not going to be able to do this. And I'm like, what? (laughs) Like, I'm in like a suit, like, yeah. I'm like, you know, we're on our way to a game. He's like, hey, we're uh, 
you know, we're going to have to, we're going to have to do this another time. And I was like, what? And they said, you know, they didn't tell us what was going on. They just said there was a problem with someone else's physical. And we were like, the only thing that this could be. So like, I mean, obviously I, I, Brady and I were there at the same time and we were like, dude, is something wrong with like his heart? Like, you know, we were like, well, you know, what's going on? Like, we didn't know. And so we went, you know, whole family just went back home and we weren't allowed to talk about anything. Also, we didn't know anything. So, you know, I, I didn't even like unpack my suitcase because, you know, they told me we'd be back out in a couple of weeks and we get it all sorted out and, you know, I'd be on my way to Kissimmee. And so didn't hear anything. Also, two days before I left, to go to Houston, my dad was in a really bad motorcycle accident and was on life support. <laughs> so yeah, oh very, very hectic. And uh, whatever came home and didn't unpack because we were like, you know, who knows when they're going to call, but I don't want to unpack and have to repack and all this. And so uh, the day of the deadline rolls around and we didn't hear anything. And the day of the debt, sorry. So the day of the deadline comes around and I get an email from Jeff Lunau. Yeah. So they offered me, you know, like nine or like 600,000. So it was 900 less than we agreed to. And obviously that's not going to work. So whatever, guess I'm going to school. And, you know, so it was school, draft school. And then I remember being out was at Bed Bath and Beyond buying stuff for my dorm. And my agent called me. He's like, hey, what are you up to? Yada yada. It's like, oh, you know, just you know, get I move in, in in three or four days. Like I'm just getting some stuff for my dorm. And he was like, you might want to put that stuff back. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, what's going on? And so he was like, you know, we have, we have a lot of, you know, talking with the NCAA to do. And so the NCAA sent me, you know, I had to go through and redo all of the clearinghouse stuff. And then they sent me like a seven page questionnaire that I had to fill out, you know, sent it right back to them. And then um, they, uh, you know, it was like, talking to savage at ucla was like okay you know you're not going to make it at you know at the beginning of the quarter so you know if you want to try to push it a couple weeks to still get in this quarter so we were like you know i basically just sat there waiting for months on the ncaa so so wait what happened you you weren't cleared from the ncaa like that late so when all this happened, we, you know, like I said, I missed that two week late enrollment. And then it was like, okay, we're going to try to go into January. And then basically like after like two months after they sent me that questionnaire that I sent back to them the next day, they sent me the same questionnaire, all the exact same questions again, two months later. And I was like, I think at this time it was like, you know, beginning of December. So this is like from September to December, like three months. And I think I finally just called my agent and I said, I'm, you know, I'm done. Oh, and so in this time, sorry, I forgot. We filed a grievance against Houston for making my signing contingent upon another players. So that was all going on while fighting with the NCAA. And it was like, just, it was just chaos. And so, you know, once, basically once we told the NCAA that we're done, like, you know, whatever, like we're not doing that. Like we, you know, you guys just sent me the same thing. They were like, oh, okay, well you're permanently ineligible anyways, due to your intent to professionalize is what they said. There's something like that. Sorry. It's been a few years. My story is a little scattered, but they said due to my intent to professionalize that I was ineligible. I never put on a professional uniform. You know, I flew to Houston, took my physical and that's it. Negotiated in, you know, a contract that I never got. 
So at that point, um, you know, our grievance settled with Houston and we were like, you know, if the NCAA has a problem, junior colleges might have a, you know, they could, what's, what's stopping them from turning around and saying the same thing. And then, and then I'm enrolled at a junior college and I can't play there either. Mm. So I ended up packing my bags and I went to Florida to play at IMG mm. in their postgraduate program. And then, uh, I was drafted by, so the, where I kind of got screwed in 2015 is I couldn't recommit to a college. So I, I think it, I had a team call in the first round. So I, I don't know what I, I think I was, I was like ranked top 30 or something in the draft, whatever it was. And uh, I, they offered me like 500 grand in the first round. And I was like, you guys can fuck off. Like, you know, I, I'm like, because you think that that's what I'm worth? No. Like, and be, basically because I, I had no bargaining, you know, I had no bargaining chip. I didn't have another option. It was like, I'm signing and everyone knows it. And so I kind of got like, I think that hurt me in that draft. But, you know, what could I do? I, I didn't have any other options. So, right. The uh, only other thing you could do is go to Indie Bowl or something. Yeah. So, um, it was funny because San Diego actually said they said they were going to take me in the second. You know, they said, you know, 800 in the second. And we were like, you know what? Whatever. Yeah. Let's go. Cause I remember I turned down Kansas City. Kansas City offered me like 850. But I was like, I'd rather play in San Diego than Kansas City at the time and i was like let's go san diego you know it's home close to home and uh sure enough that pick comes around and it wasn't my name in the second round and we were like like everyone was like what's going on you know we were we were all sitting by the tv had a big you know little draft barbecue or whatever and for the second year in a row i didn't go on that first day Mm -hmm. and i remember like it was very, it was so frustrating. And then sure enough, I was like the fifth pick in that, in that third, in that second day. But um, yeah, San Diego took me in the third, but yeah, it was like, it was a real whirlwind of like a couple of years. Well, you know, in high school, that whole, I guess one year was so chaotic. And uh, it's funny because I kind of had, I, I don't, I wouldn't call it like a breakdown, but when I got to pro ball, I got the yips. I got yipped up really bad. Whoa. Is it your first year? First year in Pro Bowl? In rookie ball. Rookie ball. So I remember I was and I I think it just happened because I hadn't done a PFP in so damn long, but like a PFP to third base, and I like yeeted it down the line. And like, you know, in, in the rookie ball, there's 15, you know, 20 guys, pitchers out there. And, uh, and so I was like, oh, let me do it again. And I did it again. And I did the same thing. I yipped it this time. Arm side yipped it. And we were like, I was like, oh, and I think I did it like four times in a row. Just, and I, it just melted. I, I fell apart. I couldn't play catch. And my first live BP, I w- I was throwing fastballs over the turtle, <laughs> What over the turtle, but I would dot my breaking ball. I just lost feel of my hand and it was crazy because it lasted like two months and it was so frustrating. And like, it's, it's, I don't know if you've ever had them, but you just lose. Oh, yeah. You, you have no, no sense of your hand, the ball, where you're letting go. And so how'd you get I, it back? Um, I mean, it took me a long time. I ended up throwing in like, a, I think I threw in like, I don't know how many games I pitched in in rookie ball, but I ended up, honestly, I had like one good day and our pitching coach, I had a good day playing catch. We were like, let's get on the mound. Like haven't been on a mound in two months. Fuck it. We're getting on the mound today. Cause it's a good day. And uh, you know, I ended up throwing a good bullpen and then it was like, just kind of trying to build one day after another. And then like, even now, like I've had them as recently as like, probably 2020 like mm. COVID year. Like, I mean, yeah, def- I definitely had it like one day where I like, you know, if I throw with someone that I'm not like all that familiar with or confident in, 
I mean, because if you're thrown to someone that's not, if you're thrown to the high school JV guy, it's like I could hurt someone. Yeah. So it, you know, if you're not if you're not right in the chest, or if you see them like clanking stuff, I'm like, okay, I gotta dial it back. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, oh shit, I'm yipping it. And basically, I just I just go into like a net or like up with a plyo and I just rip a few plyos to like nip it in the butt. And then it, and then that's, that's pretty much how I have, you know, made it much easier on myself to get over it when I have, but it's really all it is. It's like, it's anxiety. And like, I've worked with a few other guys who've had it obviously going through it for several years, my first spring training and I got it again. I'd have to go out before everyone else would go out. Just me and the pitching coach. And like a big thing for me too, is like having something behind like a fence behind whoever I'm playing catch with. I don't like just having openness that like makes me anxious. Cause if I make a bad throw, ah, he's going to have to run a half a mile to go get it. So like having a fence or something behind my catch partner helps like, and obviously once you get to a point, like you don't have to worry about it. Like I don't have to worry about it now, mm. but when you're dealing with it at the time, like that little stuff makes a huge difference. And so like, I mean, I've even seen like younger college or high school guys, like when I'm rehabbing Tommy John and they're rehabbing Tommy John, their first few days are like, Ooh, yipping all over, just straight into the ground or top of the cage. And I just, the, honestly, the biggest thing I tell them is I'm like this you know, assistant PT that you're playing catch with, his opinion doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what he thinks. It doesn't matter what anyone else in here thinks. Cause at the end of the day, that's what you're worried about. You know, most of the time, that's what you're worried about. What everyone, every, you think everyone's looking at you and they're not. Mm. And so like, that's always a big one. And like, just another thing, like I was, you know, if guys have an issue with it. I'm like, tell your throwing partner, like, Hey, I'm working through some stuff, like just bear with me and like being open about it, it like loses its power over you, you know? So like those, those are kind of the tools that I use to like, you know, whether it's me or anyone else, like kind of, you know, nip it. That's I mean, you, really, really great advice. Hard. Yeah. I'm, I'm really glad. I, I appreciate you sharing that. I'm, I know yeah. it's, I'm sure it's not easy but I know there's going to be so many people listening to this who to be honest, are it dealing is with it and they don't know what to do. It is easy because like I said, it loses its power over you when you just are like, you know what? I'm dealing with it. Sorry, bear with me. But some, every, you know, every once in a while you get a catch partner that's like kind of an ass and he's like, Oh, come on, dude. And it's like, dude, I'm try like, I'm trying here. And I just tell someone you don't need to throw at that guy go throw into a fence. If that guy's not going to be understanding and like want to help you and like want to help you through that, go throw into a fence, throw into a net. You don't need them. Like if, if anything, like taking that, that target away and focusing on the feel and the sensation for, you know, X amount of reps, like, and then building like, ah, oh, yeah, I'm starting to get it back. That's what's going to help you back further than actually throwing to someone, especially if they're not being understanding of it. Mm. That's so good, man. I'm so I'm I, I'm so happy you shared that because it's just you said. I mean, you hear it. I'm sure you've heard it before. Like if someone's dealing with that, like oh, don't talk to them. Don't yeah. Don't you know you hear that all the time? The Rick and Keel thing, all that. So it's really cool to listen to someone like yourself who has has had it and has has worked through it and has come out yeah. the other side. Like that's really cool. Yeah, I mean, I and like I said, I've had it probably four or five times. Like. Where it's like, I, you know what, this is a week, you know, I've had it the first time it was like lasted two and a half months. The second time it was like three weeks. And then it just gets shorter and shorter every time until you're like, you know what, this really doesn't matter. You know, what? like if I have a bad day of catch, you know, who cares? Nobody, me, I'm the only one that cares. Yeah. Nobody else point. cares. This guy I'm playing catch with will not think twice about it. When he goes home, it just, <laughs> and like, it's, it's so true. It's so true. Cause you stay as like, and I'm, I'm telling you when I first had this, like I, it gave me so much anxiety in like my everyday life that like, I couldn't, I had to wear black shirt. Like my, it was so bad. I was like ready to get Botox in my armpits. 
<laughs> and it's crazy because when I got over it, it went away. And I haven't had that problem since. Maybe. It came out of nowhere. And it, you know, it's it's so weird how your body works with stress and stuff. Like it's it does crazy things. That is crazy. What what are some of the things that that you've learned about yourself? And just about pitching in general, since you've, you've been in pro ball. Um, about myself, honestly. Yeah. Like, yeah, uh, you know, I used to kind of be the guy that I just wanted to go lift big. That's what I wanted to do every day. I didn't want to do the, I didn't want to go in there and spend an hour doing correctives or, you know, the boring stuff. I wanted to go in there and I wanted to, I know it was never a big back squatter, but I wanted to deadlift heavy and I was slow. And so like, as I've kind of gotten older and obviously injuries and then kind of how to take care of those injuries. Now, my process is totally different. The way I train is totally different. Um, you know, speed and agility work for a pitcher. It's important. It sucks but it's important. Nobody wants to be in there doing ladders and hurdles, but it's important. It makes you a better athlete. And if you want to be a pitcher, you better be a damn good athlete. Like, mm. and not to mention it's fast. It's all fast twitch. And guess what you're doing on the mound? Fast twitch. Everything's fast twitch, short burst, um, you know, ramp up fast. And so like, you know, I don't, I don't lift to like, I don't lift for me personally to get stronger. Like I can, you know, the first time I deadlifted after Tommy John surgery at like seven months or whatever, I still got up to four Oh five. So like for me, that just tells me I don't need to lift heavy to maintain it. I just need to do like, not just the little stuff, but you know, I need to focus on what I, you know, just the basics. I need to really dial in my correctives my mobility stuff. And I need to just kind of stick to the basics in the weight room. Like I don't need to go super heavy. It's more of like a, just a constant maintenance program. I'm not trying to build. I'm not, you know, I'm not staying out of the weight room, but it's just like a constant maintenance program. And some guys are different, you know, it, it, it like I said, it's, it's different. It's different for everyone. But for me with my injury history, my back, my problems, that's what I do. Mm. You're working smarter now. I try. Yeah. 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 Like, From, I mean, like I said, that, that, like all the correctives, all that stuff, it's not fun. It yeah. is hard. You know, you're cramping in places you probably never thought you'd cramp before, but that's, you know, that's what makes a difference in your ability to move properly on the mound. Hmm. What are, and what are me, some, what are some tips that, that you would give uh, based on your experience, based off of the, the, the other pitchers that you've, you know, talked with and worked with throughout your career what's something like a, a pitcher that a tip that they could use on the mound that will, will help them Im immediately that that you've maybe learned since you started in pro ball um i gotta think about that it's funny because like i i mean as dumb as it sounds don't think like when you go up in there i mean it depends on what what you're working on. Like, I guess it's hard to say, but like, you know, if, if you're at a, if you're at a point where like you, you like where your stuff is at, like if, if this isn't about stuff yeah, and it's about like process on the mound, I say, I don't think about anything. I really, you just, you just pick like, up the ball and just try to throw it as hard as you can. I don't try to throw it as hard as I can, but I, you know, I think more about like my mechanical checklist. Mm. That's what goes through my head. Cause I know the rest is going to work itself out. I, if that, if that, if I'm moving the way that I sh want to and need to be moving, I don't have to worry about it. And it's funny. Cause like when I go back and I watch my, like my bullpen footage, I'm, I have the least serious bullpens ever. I'm like, Oh yeah. You ain't touching that. Like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like it while I'm throwing a bullpen and it's because like some people are like, oh, zip it, like take it seriously. And it's like, that's just not my process. Like if I obviously if I'm struggling with something, it is, but I don't when I'm I guess it's different when you're a little bit younger. When you're younger, you struggle 
a little bit to kind of make those adjustments. And uh, I think it just comes down to proprioception, knowing your body, being comfortable in your body. It's like, that'll come just because you're 18 and you throw a bullpen where you can't locate a breaking ball. Dude, worry about other stuff, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. If you sit there and beat yourself, like there's obviously ways to make an adjustment. Like with off-speed stuff, I think it's all about setting your sights, you know, where understanding what the break of your ball is and set your sights and let it freaking rip. Like for me, I throw a curveball or a curveball and slider. Like, you know, if I want to throw my curveball for a strike, I'm trying to throw it through the catcher's mask or the umpire's mask, depending on where it's at that day. If I'm trying to bounce it, I'm trying to throw it through the glove. I'm just lowering the sight. I'm not doing anything different. I'm just lowering the sight. So it's not always about like changing your wrist. I know sometimes we like to overcomplicate things and it's not, it's not always the answer. It's change your sight. Just go, for, you know, that, and so for me, like with, like I said, with breaking balls, like that's, that's what I do. But I think as you get older, it's a lot easier, at least in my experience, to make adjustments on the fly because you have lived in this body for so much longer. Like 18 year olds, high school guys, college guys, they've only been in an adult body for like three years. Yeah. It's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> like they're like Bambi still. It's funny. Cause like my, my younger cousin, he's a, he's going to be a soft or he's a sophomore this year. And he grew, he, you know, he's grown like a foot in the last like year and a half. And I'm like, you know, and it's, but it's funny because like his mechanics have kind of fallen apart too in that time. And it's like, you know what, I'm not even worried about it because obviously my aunt, he's worried about it, but it's like, dude, you're, you're like Bambi. You just, you just grew this much and you don't know how to live in that body yet. You don't understand how to live in this new body yet. So it just, it takes time and it takes learning your body before you can make those adjustments really quick. That's why, I mean, that's why, I mean, yes, there are younger guys in the big leagues now, but that's why, you know, like look at DeGrom. DeGrom's gotten better as he's gotten, gotten older. Like his, he's tightened up his movement patterns a ton. Like, and, and it's funny because you see it across the board, guys, you know, if, if you age like fine wine, you're probably going to be in the game for a long time. Mm, that's good stuff, man. That's uh, yeah. Patience is something that's, that's hard for, I think, yes, a, a lot patience. of people. Yeah. Very hard. So but. many guys like want this you know, the, the top velocity, 13 miles an hour in 13 days program. <laughs> that's just not, it's just not realistic. Right. It's, right. You know, Jacob, you, I appreciate you coming on, man. It's been a ton of fun. And it's, yeah, of course. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, some of the stuff you shared on here, I, I know it's going to impact a lot of people in, in a good way. So I, I appreciate you opening up about it. And again, man, I, I uh, thank you for coming on. Of course. I'm happy to be here. You know what? One of my favorite things about the last two years, despite being injured, is coaching. I got into coaching, just kind of doing private stuff. And then, you know, and I had a big group of college guys and high school guys. And I kind of I kind of stayed away from the youth a little bit because, you know, the message most of the time that I'm getting across doesn't resonate with them as much as it does the older guys. You know, and I've been in their position a lot and. Uh, there's probably not anything that they're going through that I haven't been through. Mm. And like, you know, a lot of the times it's like that stigma of like, I mean, obviously like, you know, be a man, just, you know, just lift more. And it's like, dude, that's not always the answer. And like, I mean, when I was having a tough time in life, you know, I, I put myself in therapy because like, you know what, I got to get that out. Like, and it's, it's so much healthier not to just try to be a man and freaking shove it down. It's so much healthier in your life. And you just, it's like the weight of the world comes off your shoulders. And so, I mean, I've, you know, even guys with like that I've had that have come to me with the yips, I'm like, what's going on in your home life? Hmm. Cause that stuff affects you. It does. Whether you want to believe it or not, your relationships affect you. If you're in a bad relationship with, you know, your girlfriend, whatever, like it's going to affect you on the field. It's going to affect you how you feel physically. It's going to affect your immune system. I mean, when I was in 2018, when I was in the big leagues, like I was in a pretty poor relationship and I had plantar warts on my feet. 
that hurt so bad. There were days I had, I couldn't, I could barely like put cleats on. And I, you know, I was shaving them with razor blades, trying to melt them with acid, all this for like months and they wouldn't go away. Two weeks after I ended that relationship, they never came back. They went away and never came back. So it's, it's, it's amazing what stress that kind of stress can do to your body, your immune system, your ability to stay healthy. Like it, everything is connected. That's, it really is. And that's, that's the stuff that's overlooked. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree, man. hundred percent agree, but I appreciate it, brother. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. And you know what, if it helps one person, I'm happy. So, or if someone needs anything and wants to reach out, you know, I, I always do my best to get back to everyone. So what's, what's the, where's the best place to reach at? Probably DMs, DM me on Instagram. I'll, you know, I've had, a, I've actually, I, I don't know. I don't remember where I've shared it before, but I, you know, I've talked a little bit about the Yip stuff before. I think it was honestly in a, like a baseball America article or something. Mm. And uh, I've had people reach out about the Yips and, you know, I, I do anything I can to help. I go in and I explain every, you know, I try to explain it the same way I explained it to you. It's, it's just different for everyone. What's, what's your Instagram handle? Uh, juicy underscore Jake 33. Okay. We'll put that link in the show notes too. Yeah. Awesome. 